Hell's Kitchen judges have just dropped a behind-the-scenes bombshell that no one saw coming. The way it's shown, it may look big to you or me, but in reality, they're actually quite small. Wow. The competitors will be living in dorms, located only steps away from the kitchens. What's more, one room is shared by up to four or five people. Knowing how stressful the show can get, and that tension is definitely not an uncommon occurrence, it could be really awkward to stay in the same room together after the fact. Plus, let's not forget that the cameras are always watching. For most contestants, the fact that they are being watched in and of itself is a huge reason to get worked up. Like, these guys get zero privacy. Remember this awkward moment? Anything. Do your thing, boo. And it's hard to find genuine people. According to an interview, contestants have to wear a microphone at all times, even to bed. So it doesn't matter how loud they snore or how loudly they get yelled at for snoring, the cameras keep rolling. Just like in season 10, when Robin came into the room Barbie, Dana, and Christina were sleeping in because Kimmy was snoring too loud. And because the cameras are on 24-7, the lights don't get turned off either. Like, at least invest in some night vision tech like on Survivor or something so these poor people can get some sleep. In an interview with North Jersey, former contestant Justin mentioned that he never slept much, so he just stayed awake. And so did a lot of people. But here's something else that's interesting. A Mashed article claims that the best way to make sure a particular incident isn't shown on the air is to sing popular songs, especially ones that come with huge royalty fees. Music rights are expensive, and I don't think Fox wants to pay to show someone singing their own horrible cover of I Wanna Break Free by Queen. Anyway, jokes aside, in a YouTube video by a production designer, he gave his viewers a tour of the season 18 set, in which he revealed that the mirrors in the shared kitchen are actually camera aisles. This allowed the production crew to shoot all the action with simple handheld cameras. And when I say action, I mean action. What's more, when the contestants are not sweating it out in the heat of the kitchen, they could at least sit back and relax in either the indoor or outdoor patio. But here's the fun part. Did you know that the contestants also had access to an exclusive jacuzzi? Well, it looks like the production team made sure the contestants had a bit of fun before facing Ramsey in the kitchen. Good on them. They definitely need all the help they can get. And if you're not big on getting in the water, you can maybe chill by the fire pit, make yourself an incredible dinner, or get a full-fledged workout at the in-house gym. It's a very important space because a lot goes on here. The cast will deliberate who to nominate. They will work out their menus here. I mean, just look at this place, you guys. The contestants are living large, at least before they hit the dorm. And hey, here's a little reminder for all you would-be contestants. You might want to chill, you might want to relax, but Ramsey's always watching, even in the dorms. And what better way to express that than having Ramsey at his worst on the wall? A little reminder that Gordon's always watching. Yep, in the midst of all the luxury, you better not forget who the real boss is. Where's the lunch well, Ramsey might be the boss, no doubt, but let's talk about some real royalty. And by that, I mean the customers. Seeing all the customers getting the chance to dine in Hell's Kitchen while getting to see Ramsey in action to boot has got to make you wonder how you could get to the dining room yourself. I mean, who wouldn't want to dine in Hell's Kitchen, right? Sending more food out to the diners. It's really yummy, just a big chunk of lobster. Well, if you ignore the fact that you might get served something as raw as the day it came off the field anyway. And hey, who wouldn't tolerate that in order to see all the action live? Well, if it was me, I'd be waiting for Ramsey to yell something like this. Those two, yeah, are cooking like donkeys. Come on! Donkey's Kitchen, should we change the fucking logo? The feeling of seeing the man himself hurling insults into the kitchen live has gotta be absolutely exhilarating. It's not like I don't feel bad for the chefs, though. Look, I know all of them are here to give their best, and nobody actually comes all this way just to make a fool of themselves. But you gotta give it to him. More often than not, they end up fueling Ramsey's fire, and the result of said fire is something else. Fuck off you, you fat, useless sack of fucking Yankee danky doodle shite. Fuck off with you. But let's address the main question on everyone's mind. 
What if I told you that the customers who eat at the restaurants are not actually real customers, but actors? Yeah, I know, what a letdown, right? Can't say I'm surprised, but still. Seeing some of the customers acting like this, well, you'd think they were genuine just by looking at them. Chef! Right, don't whistle at me, I'm not your fucking dog, yeah? You look more like a dog than I do. Fuck off, will you? Damn. I mean, I guess a regular customer wouldn't have the balls to do something so ridiculous. Had it been a real customer, I'd like to think they'd be better behaved than this. Why is there no pumpkin in my risotto? Right. Well, I don't blame the production crew for featuring actors as their customers. Because imagine if it was actually a real restaurant that you could, like, make a reservation for. Do you think it would be fair to leave a real customer endlessly waiting for their food? On a good day, the service still ends up taking way too long. An hour and a half going by before the food reaches the table certainly isn't uncommon. I don't think any customers in their right mind would wait that long for food. Like, extrapolating that hour and a half figure, you could easily spend three or four hours just to taste a couple of tiny portions. And again, they could land on your table totally raw. Also, since it's a competition and you're going to be served by different teams, imagine what it would feel like to be fed by the losing team. Which reminds me of this moment. Andy, where's our food? Do you want mine, Mom? Are you going to eat that? Toss it this way. Here. Well, what you just saw was but a prologue to what I'm about to reveal next. According to a Reddit user, the customers are staff members' families and other people associated with Fox. But I mean, it's the internet, right? Anybody can say anything. Because according to an article which was published in 2005, the diners were all real. Back then, the diners were recruited to test out the food and service of the restaurant. What's more, apparently, the diners didn't have to pay a dime. Every single dish on the menu was free. And, in turn, the diners were paid $50 for their time. Of course, though, there was a catch. The diners had to sign standard non-disclosure agreements, which explains why no one's claimed to have dined at any of the show's restaurants. Also, as we all know, anything can happen on Hell's Kitchen. Sometimes, both teams might just get kicked out of the service. End of the day for me! Get out! Given how unpredictable the show was, actually getting food was never guaranteed. But hey, at least they were given free alcohol and bread to pass the time. So, if you by any chance get lucky enough to be a part of the customer group, if such a thing even exists, maybe eat something before leaving, even if it's just a slice of bread. But now, let's move on to the most important part of the show. The contestants. After years and years of watching the show and going through a ton of interviews from contestants, we now know the entire audition process is pretty long. Sometimes, the contestants would have auditioned for a particular season, but would be cast in a completely different one. And sometimes, the producers would have two seasons worth of contestants audition together. For instance, one of our favorite and most successful contestants, Christina Wilson, auditioned when the producers were casting for both season 9 and 10. Imagine being in season 9 and dealing with Elise. I think that would have been worse than dealing with Robin. Gal definitely dodged a bullet there. Christina's audition had three stages. One was in Philadelphia, one was in New York City, and then she had the final one in LA. Before going to the final one, she also had to go through a couple of interviews on the East Coast. Phew, that's definitely a lot for just one show. But if you take a moment to think about it, that means the likes of Joseph Tinnelly and Jason Underwood have also gone through the same process before making it to Hell's Kitchen itself. In an interview with GoTo Whitney, Manda Palomino shared her own experience with the audition process. You're put in sequester in a hotel for a few days, and that's when you do all your, you know, prep stuff like, you know, headshots and meeting with producers and kind of like getting your bearings together. Being in Hell's Kitchen is like a full-time job for the contestants, which means they have to leave their actual job to take part in the show. However, the chefs are compensated on a well-paid basis. A decent paycheck of around $700 to $1,000 allegedly makes up their compensation. Fox can afford to pay that much without breaking a sweat because all of Ramsey's shows bring in a ton of money. According to Forbes, the shows, which, when put together, add up to roughly 72 hours of content and made over $150 million in ad sales. Looks like the contestants are pretty well taken care of. 
But don't forget, they still have to follow a ton of rules. And the first on the list is, nobody can get physical. It's no doubt that there were times when contestants had heated altercations between themselves, let alone with Ramsey himself. But all that effort is absolutely pointless, because Ramsey is almost always surrounded by bodyguards. It's not like he really needs them, but it can't hurt to keep them around. You see, Ramsey is not only a black belt in karate, but he also believes in keeping himself fit. Remember how he always looks for a gym when filming Hotel Hell? But Joseph wasn't the only guy who tried to fight Ramsey. Apparently, in season one, Jeff, who in hindsight was actually pretty similar to our man Joe, quit the show midway through before trying to fight Ramsey. According to a Redditor, after Jeff tried to leave, Chef Ramsey went out to confront him. According to a former producer, Jeff decided to give Chef Ramsey a piece of his mind about the treatment he got in Hell's Kitchen. He also wrote, The guy got backstage in a hallway off of the kitchen set where Gordon was standing. We had no cameras in this area, but Chef was still connected to an active Lavalier microphone and the operators in the control room could hear what was going on, but not see. Jeff then charged up to get in Chef Ramsey's face, and Chef Ramsey was standing on a raised step leading into another room. Jeff came up way too close, and Chef Ramsey, who was caught off guard, spun around. The producer wrote further, it was enough to get the contestant to step backwards and off the step. It was a freak occurrence, but as he stepped backwards, he twisted both of his ankles with a loud snap, and he immediately cried out in pain, thinking his bones had broken. No wonder at the end of the episode, there was a message displayed saying Jeff left due to injuries. Speaking of injuries, being a part of Hell's Kitchen can actually be pretty unhealthy for the contestants. When we think about a restaurant being unhealthy, we think about high fat, high sugar, and a ton of calories in a single dish. In the case of Hell's Kitchen, it's not about the food, it's the competition itself. To get a chance to work with Ramsey, contestants go through services with rigorous timetables. It not only harms their physical health, but their mental health too. Yep, HK is as tough and stressful as competitions come. What's more, sometimes the contestants go without sleep for days as we learned all too well earlier in the video. And if they make a single mistake, they immediately get screamed at. To top it all off, they always live in fear of getting eliminated. The only respite they have is to booze or smoke, which isn't exactly healthy. In an interview with Delish in 2010, a producer said how they started with four smokers in season two, but ended with 10. Yeesh. They somehow end up smoking after being in the competition up to a certain point because of the stress. The producers also explain that as part of the boot camp, contestants would need to work long hours in hot and dangerous conditions. Moreover, they also put their lives on hold for five weeks. No contact with families, no television, no outside world, nothing. The only time they see the outside world is when they win a challenge. No wonder they're so excited when they get those sort of chances. On top of that. These stars over here. <laughs> David Bowie, uh -huh. Spike Jones. On top of that, some of them have needed to quit their jobs to participate. Take Tech Moore as an example. Apparently, the contestants get either no sleep or up to five hours of it. If there's no dinner service that night, they get six. Their average day would start at 7 a.m. and end at 2 a.m. No wonder some of them look so drained. And this pretty much explains why some contestants who have worked as executive or sous chefs in the past have struggled to make something as simple as a salad or a risotto. I mean, come on, after working in the industry for so long, it's nigh unbelievable they'd screw up something as simple as that, right? Well, according to tech, producers sneakily swap ingredients to get contestants to slip up. And of course, the desired reaction from Ramsey. It creates more drama, and more drama means better numbers. I mean, I get where they're coming from, since this sort of stuff is really entertaining. Yeah. What are you doing? I didn't mean to, Chef, I'm sorry. It's not even 30 seconds away. That's what fucks me off. Coming back to tech, she said, production would come in and mess with ingredients, swap out your salt and sugar, so people would look like complete fucking assholes. Tech was not the only one to come forward with that sort of insider knowledge. Jen Yamola also shared her experience about the infamous spaghetti incident. She said, I was just sick about it. I tried to talk to them about it. I was like, this is my career. This is everything I've worked for. My life is over. They never sent anyone to talk to me. 
That aside, have you noticed how the contestants keep getting more and more flustered as the show goes on? Well, there's a solid reason behind it. In an interview with Delish, Hell's Kitchen winner Ariel Malone revealed how the producers worked to catch them off guard. She said, We thought we were going to BLT Steakhouse to eat, so we're all dressed up. I had six inch heels on, and then surprise, we're actually cooking a dish. I didn't get to change. They gave me kitchen shoes since that's a safety hazard, but I wound up having to tie up the hem of my dress so I wouldn't trip on it. And that was not the only thing they were surprised by. One morning, the contestants were woken up by blaring music. Come on! Dogs! Dogs? Come on, everybody, get up. Let's go. Everybody up, grab an outfit, get dressed, and we'll see you downstairs. I would be pissed as hell if someone woke me up like that. Ya boy here at FT needs his beauty sleep. Ariel said, The producers knew some of us grew up watching the show, so they like to mix things up. If we got a little too familiar, they'd wake us up two hours early. The producers also never dropped any clues or helped them prepare for filming the episodes. Whatever was done was ultimately done by the contestants themselves, even if they had no idea what sort of challenge was around the corner. Ariel revealed, There is zero prep. None whatsoever. All you can do is just brace yourself for whatever's going to come. Who knew, right? What's more, some viewers even think the contestants are actors. Like, take Joseph Tinnelly, for example. Most people think he was planted to give the show's ratings a much-needed boost when they started to dip. What do you think? If this is true, then which other contestants do you think were part of this shadow cabal of production team plants? Let me know in the comments below. And just when we're talking about the producers faking it, turns out Hell's Kitchen itself wasn't an actual restaurant. That was until 2018, when the first ever Hell's Kitchen restaurant was opened in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. The 19th and 20th seasons of Hell's Kitchen were filmed at the Caesar's Entertainment Studios property near the Las Vegas Strip. But for some scenes in those episodes, the contestants visited the actual restaurant. According to Gold Derby, Season 21 and Season 22 were both filmed at the Hell's Kitchen restaurant itself prior to the pandemic. But what about before 2018? A TV Guide writer who attended a final taping of Hell's Kitchen in 2012 shared what Hell's Kitchen actually looked like. The writer wrote, Hell's Kitchen is built on a soundstage, and everything appears even more exaggerated than on TV. From the menacingly oversized, flaming HK Pitchfork logo, to the stairway that winds up to the balcony where the two finalists stand behind frosted glass doors to discover their fates. The only real difference is the lighting. It's far brighter than you'd expect in a fine dining restaurant, no doubt to better capture Chef Ramsay's apoplectic fits. And back then, since it wasn't really a fine dining restaurant, guests had to literally walk out to the trailers to relieve themselves since there were no bathroom facilities at the studio. Either way, fake restaurant or not, nothing can deter a determined contestant from achieving their dreams. Not even the fact that the grand prize job itself wasn't guaranteed. I mean, working for Chef Ramsay has got to be a dream come true. Don't even get me started on the prize money. However, the show's producers tend to tweak the rewards every once in a while. Like, Danny Veltri wasn't offered the head chef position, and neither was Christina McAmer, who was offered a senior chef position instead. Holly Ulgalde from Season 7 was supposed to get the head chef position in Savoy Grill London, but unfortunately, because of issues with getting a work visa, she ultimately never took up the position. Instead, she was named Celebrity Signature Chef in Fort Lauderdale. Decent enough consolation prize, I guess. Here's another example. According to another Redditor, Michelle Tribble actually got the position, but she didn't exactly perform the duties of a chef. Instead, she was more of a customer service representative. Yeah, kind of a letdown ending for this episode, but these aren't the only secrets that lay hidden within the walls of Hell's Kitchen. If you know something that I missed, let me know in the comments below. I'm always digging around to uncover HK mysteries, and I'd love your help. Signing up for Hell's Kitchen is no joke. And the way even the toughest chefs have been brought to tears over the years is proof enough. But while the contestants are being tested to see if they're head chef material in front of the cameras, there are plenty of rules they have to follow behind the scenes. 
Jones. I mean, they've got to cut all ties from the outside world, including their families, for the entire season. I mean, not even Ramsey breaks that rule. You guys know I never come into these dorms. I give you your peace and respect that privacy. Understood? Yes, chef. Yes, chef. Not surprising why some of them end up behaving a little, uh, stir-crazy at times. <laughs> I start drinking and I start doing <laughs> Uh, whoops, sorry, wrong example. I mean, I don't think disconnecting from the outside world mattered to Raj in any way. The dude was just being himself day in and day out. And to be honest, I love him for that. But it definitely took a toll on most, uh, well, normal contestants, just like her. Oh my, oh my God. <laughs> How exciting. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Considering the situation she was in, that reaction is more than fair. Being away from your family for five whole weeks in any situation is pretty stressful, let alone in a place like Hell's Kitchen. Getting reunited like that is gonna be super emotional, no matter how you slice it. Now, in Ramsey's own words, Difficult, tough, sweaty, emotional environment. Yeah, I couldn't have summed it up better myself. But let's dig into the hard, difficult, tough, sweaty part of the show. You know how long they're up and at them every day? How about 12 to 16 hours of being on their feet? And at the end of the day, they still need to cook for themselves. If that's not sweaty, I don't know what is. And their sleep schedule also gets taken pretty off course, with most contestants going to bed around 2 a.m. and waking up at 7 a.m. to start back up their 12 to 16 hour workday. That is the bare minimum amount of sleep to tackle such physically and mentally demanding work. But they'll be using old-fashioned alarm clocks to wake up. You can't even walk into the building without dropping your tech at the door and switching over to analog dials. Yeah, it's hard to sneak in anything, because when it comes to security, nobody does it better than Hell's Kitchen. They honestly make the TSA look like a bunch of kids playing dress-up. I mean, you remember what happened with Trenton and Megan, right? Whose is this? Who smokes? I have no idea, Chef. I have no idea, Chef. I want an chef. answer now. Yeah, even something as small as a prank had both finalists coming close to shitting bricks. I'm like about to cry, Chef. <laughs> so I was like, don't shut us down. And don't forget, the further you go into the competition, the tougher the going gets. And Ramsey isn't going to go easy on anyone, especially with his standards getting higher and higher as the weed is separated from the chow. And the better you become, then the more I'll put you under pressure. And for those wondering why Ramsey is always so rude with his criticism, he set the record straight. I don't hate these guys. I spend more time with these guys than I do with my family. According to Ramsey, it all comes down to the point of the show. Nobody can become a head chef with just book smarts alone. It comes through experience, heartache, and, of course, pressure. Pressure's healthy, and pressure creates perfection. Ramsey does his damnedest to make sure everybody feels the heat before they can even think about winning the competition. And sometimes, he can figure out who's gonna go far 60 seconds in. Simple setup. A very glamorous, multi-million dollar restaurant. Which is why this signature dish challenge is far from just an opening act, but the most important episode to make an impression. But I've talked about so many signature stinkers since I started my channel, so safe to say not everybody got the memo. That aside, you can't even expect the best and brightest to succeed if they're always getting beaten down. Whether during a challenge or a service, anybody would crack under the pressure. So it's no wonder they go all out with the rewards. You'll be having the most amazing lunch at the beautiful Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. <laughs> yeah, if that isn't able to bring you out of a funk, nothing will. But now, let's get into the real juicy stuff. Oh yeah. This was just the beginning. Like for one, it's crucial to memorize the entire menu. And in season four, episode two, Petroza figured that out firsthand when he was going through a rough patch during dinner prep. When Ramsey dropped a pop quiz on his head, he just couldn't deliver. The, um, the, um, 
so it was time for the guy to hit the books until he had it memorized down to the last detail. Do me a favor, get out. Because when it comes to Ramsey, anything less is unacceptable. To know the menu inside out, eat, drink, sleep, breathe it. Meanwhile, Petroza was grumbling about it back in the dorms, considering it had been 19 years since he had to memorize somebody else's menu. During this period, it was it's really bothering me. Once he returned to the kitchen, Ramsey wasn't done schooling him. He dragged him into the pantry for round two. You're now on the verge of making me look stupid now. Do you understand? From the desserts up, what are they? Now, this is where Petroza's memory was really put to the test. He was faced with the same task, but he still ran into a few mistakes. Remember when I said anything less isn't good enough? Okay. Upstairs and start again. Okay. Quick, let's go. Okay. Petroza was feeling overwhelmed and frustrated. So much so that he was wondering if Hell's Kitchen was even the right place for him anymore. No, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. However, just in the nick of time, Bobby set him straight. He offered him support and reminded him of the passion that brought him to HK in the first place. Come on, come on, put it down. No, I'm Chef done, Marcy, man. Chef Marcy, he's right out there. And I mean, huge props to Bobby. That's still gotta be one of the most selfless moments to have ever happened on the show. Anyway, Bobby helped Petroza reflect on his performance, and that was all he needed to get his head in the game. And get back in the game he did. After a quick celebratory high five with Ramsey. Now, get in the fucking kitchen. Petroza got back to work. Okay, now that we got the menu out of the way, it turns out what you use to cook these menu items is equally important. Some tools are more appropriate than others in Hell's Kitchen, but unfortunately, this contestant right here didn't get the memo. The day we need that to cook a breast of chicken, get out! See, it's simple. If you can't judge the cook of the meat by look and feel alone, you're not head chef material, full stop. But at least Barbie's mistake was made out of ignorance. And speaking of Barbie, on day five, she was holding down the appetizer station with Christina Wilson. Despite their excitement for the Mexican night theme, it wasn't long before they ran into trouble. Barbie ended up sending out a batch of mussels that tasted like they had never even been in the ocean in the first place, alongside another batch that was actually seasoned. Apparently, the I in Barbie stands for inconsistency. I once totally abandoned and abused. Even the color's different. Bland, delicious, unbelievable. Although Christina offered to jump in and help, Barbie wanted to fix her mistakes on her own terms. Got it, it's right here, I got it. I had some trouble starting off, but I'm gonna fight back. I can do this. And what do you know? She actually managed to pull it off and get the appetizers out in time. But when it was time to serve up the main courses, Dana and Kimmy ended up breaking another important rule. Fish and meat on the same tray. Meat dripping into the fish, fish dripping into the meat. Fish and meat on the same plate. Yeah, I don't think Surf and Turf was on the menu that night. Now, Ramsey was waiting for one of them to step up and take responsibility, but neither seemed too terribly interested in that responsibility at first. Was it a ghost? Somebody tell me what is happening. Fucking idiots. I did, Chef. Eventually, though, Kimmy owned up to it. And just when you thought they were on the right track, Danielle ended up breaking another rule. One that's uh, maybe a little more obvious than the surf and turf ban. Yeah, Danielle's raw meat was the catalyst for a complete reset in the reg kitchen. But getting a clean slate apparently didn't do much to clean up her act, since the raw stuff kept coming. Raw pork again, pink and bloody in the middle. I give up. The red team was falling apart, and Barbie wanted to bounce back no matter what it took to make it happen. She wasn't about to serve Ramsay anything raw. In a last-ditch effort to salvage the mess, that fateful tool we talked about earlier made its grand debut. A thermometer. Yeah, so here's where a big difference between home cooking and professional yes, cooking rears its head. For personal use, thermometers are great. 
but they puncture the meat and can dry it out if it didn't have a chance to rest properly. And unfortunately for Barbie, she was caught red-handed by Ramsey himself. The day we need that to cook a breast of chicken. Get out! Not a good look. During the deliberations, she decided to nominate herself. She knew she wasn't the weakest link on the team, but she knew she had messed up. And fortunately for her, Ramsey decided to give her another chance. Barbie may have broken a rule, but her decision to nominate herself was the responsible thing to do. And real ballsy at the same time. Two virtues which Ramsey holds in very high regard. And well, that's how she survived to cook another day. But I don't think she'll ever forget what happened anytime soon. Speaking of, remember when Andrew tried to take some shortcuts to expedite things and sous chef Scott caught him? Hey, get the fuck back in there. You think I'm fucking stupid? I'm not stupid like you. Okay, here's a little lesson for the ignorant few of you from the man himself. Sous chef is, is the second in command or, or the person that oversees everything for the chef. Yeah, it's in the name. They're the head chef's right hand man, and it's on them to make sure things come out looking perfect. Now, imagine having the audacity to mess with one of them. That's exactly what happened in season 12. When things got crazy between sous chef Andy, one of my favorites, by the way, and a seriously disrespectful chef. So what happened is, sometime during service, Anton found himself in a bit of a pickle after completely ruining his Wellingtons. And sous chef Andy got dragged right into the middle of his mess. But Anton was in no mood to own up to his mistakes. So he started slinging Ramsey's favorite thing. Excuses, excuses, and more excuses. Now, call me crazy, but that doesn't exactly scream maturity, does it? I mean, come on, Anton, everyone expected better from you. But did you catch the look on Andy's face? She was so not having it. But Anton apparently couldn't help but pour more fuel on the fire. Andy was teetering on the edge of her patience. But when push came to shove, she didn't just lose it. Oh, no. Anton ended up being on the receiving end of a lot of pent-up frustration. Like, tell me you could stand up to this roar and not completely wither. Yeah, didn't think so. Thankfully, Anton ended up getting the boot that same day. He paid the price for his disrespect. Let that serve as a reminder to never, ever mess with a sous chef. Because, I mean, it's not easy to handle a whole brigade. And that explains why most of them are pretty hot-headed. But, coming back to Anton, remember those excuses he bandied out? Well, those are small potatoes compared to Ramsey's mortal enemy. Lies! What better way to put deception center stage than what happened in season 20, episode 3? If you know, you know. But if you don't, get ready. So, Alex Lennick was manning the meat station alongside Antonio. But soon enough, Kevin ended up making a rookie mistake. And let me tell you, Ramsey wasn't impressed. The miscommunication had him seeing red, and things had barely even gotten started. But get started they did. A little later, Alex found himself face to face with a massive issue with the garnishes that Jay was responsible for. One that threatened to completely derail the meat station. In spite of imminent doom being on the horizon, Alex managed to get his New York strip approved. And he rode that confidence into trying to tackle the chicken solo. Any guesses how that played out? Yeah, no wonder it was raw. But once the refires got going, Alex was desperate for a second opinion on the chicken. This is when Trenton suggested cooking it for another nine minutes. But Alex was more concerned with quantity then quality. Finally, the entrees made their way to Ramsey, and history went and repeated itself. I mean, it was so pink that Curtis Stone noticed it from across the room. And Marino threw in a quip about how he could cook a better chicken himself to boot. And that was the final straw. 
Ramsey wasn't gonna take the embarrassment they served him lying down. So, the men got the boot from the kitchen, and nominations came knocking for two of them. Alex reminded everyone about how he tried to get a second opinion on the chicken, but Trenton didn't think it was enough to let him off the hook completely. Alex immediately deflected the blame to Jay, but also threw all the other stations that faced communication problems under the bus too. But surprisingly, Jay owned up to his mistake, although he refused to be the only one that'd go down due to the raw chicken. But the rest of the chefs saw the opportunity for what it was and decided to throw him under the bus and Alex while they were at it. So Alex found himself as the blue team's first nominee and Jay wasn't far behind. Ramsey wasted no time digging into the meat of the matter, but Jay stood his ground, blaming Alex and his station for the communication breakdown. However, Alex wasn't about to let Jay's accusation slide. He was determined to set the record straight. Alex argued that the real issues stopped and started with the chicken orders. He insisted that he could cook chicken, but at this point, Ramsey wasn't buying it. And then Ramsey revealed the trick he'd had up his sleeve. Like, where did Antonio even come from? I've literally mentioned him, like, once up to this point. Well, either way, Ramsey was blaming him for the chicken fiasco. But Antonio denied involvement outright. Oh wait, it gets crazier. Alex completely changed his tune, deciding to point the finger at Trenton. And of course, Trenton denied ever even saying a word about the chicken. With the entire room devolving into a chaotic shouting match, Ramsey had to take a brief recess in his office to clear his head before getting back into it. The four nominees were left squabbling over who did what, while the women on the sidelines were… well, they were there too. Alex was on a mission to blame literally anyone but himself, picking up right where he'd left off with Sam. But finally, after a whole lot of back and forth, Alex came clean. With the spotlight now on Sam, he defended himself by stating that he didn't actually touch the chicken, but merely pulled it out for Alex. But when everything was said and done, Ramsey completely took the chicken out of the equation, and Jay's inability to deliver on the garnishes ultimately sealed his fate. Talk about coming out of left field. Well, let me give you a second to get your head on straight. If you're anything like me, your head's gotta be spinning from the twists and turns that elimination took. Okay, here comes another rarely spoken of rule, needing to actually go through with the punishment. Yeah, if you're a huge fan of the show, I'm sure you can already see where I'm headed with this. Well, after a brutal loss in the ostrich meat challenge, the blue team found themselves facing a punishment that involved handling raw pine nuts and dealing with the goo and eggshells in the dining room. But here's where things took a turn for the worse. Matt decided he was too good for the dirty job. He started whining about the judges not getting his culinary genius. I can wait inside of the kitchen. I don't want to sit here and listen to these guys degrading me and talking Oh my god. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that, dude. While the rest of the team rolled up their sleeves and got to work, Matt was nowhere to be found. Instead of lending a hand, he was back in the dorms chilling out while his team was sweating it out. When Aaron finally called him out over it, Matt practically exploded with rage. Instead of owning up to his responsibilities like, you know, a decent person, he decided to throw in the towel and quit the competition altogether. I don't give a but Ramsey wasn't about to let Matt off the hook that easily. He called him over for a quick chat, and let me tell you, things got real. Matt started arguing that the competition itself was unfair, but Ramsey quickly put him in his place. He made it crystal clear that the judge's decisions were final, and if Matt didn't want to play by the rules, he was more than welcome to pack his bags and leave. But then, all of a sudden, Matt suddenly had a change of heart. He decided he wasn't going to quit after all. So, like, why throw the fit in the first place? Honestly, guys, it's anyone's guess. It seemed to me like Matt had literally zero respect for the competition and didn't really have it in him to keep going. So what was the point in trying to fight to keep the guy on the show, Ramsey? <sighs> well, whatever. I'm sure the pressure in Hell's Kitchen can drive anyone up the wall. 
But at the end of the day, the whole point of the show is seeing who can rise above that pressure and prove to the world they have what it takes to lead. Got any other rules to add to the list? Get in the comments if I miss something obvious. If you make a big enough fool out of me, I'll get this, own up to it by featuring it in a future video. Yeah, imagine if Alex was as humble as I am. <laughs> anyway. This shocking revelation will change everything you thought you knew about the show. You were able to figure that out from the title? Oh, oh. Here I come. Oh, here I come. Oh. <laughs> Just checking if you were paying attention. Seriously, though, today I'll be revealing some of the most terrifying secrets from Hell's Kitchen. And stick around for the last one. I promise you it's a doozy. To get things started, well, of course all of us value our privacy, right? You wouldn't like it if your most vulnerable moments were aired on national TV as cheap entertainment, right? You can probably see where I'm going with this. Privacy is completely non-existent on the Hell's Kitchen set. Of course, and we're all mic'd up too, so right. they can hear every word you say. Contestants quickly realize that once they've signed up for a reality show like Hell's Kitchen, their reality becomes the show. Thinking of sneaking in a quick nap or dealing with personal issues? Not happening. Cameras and microphones are everywhere, even in the bathrooms. That's right, no escaping them. Unless you find a way to sneak into Ramsey's dressing room, I guess. But seriously, contestants have revealed that they need to keep their lapel microphones on and armed at all times, even at bedtime. In those bright lights, they're glaring at you relentlessly throughout the day. Ooh, and the night too. Forget about getting a peaceful midnight nap. Those bright lights aren't dimming for anyone. As long as someone's awake, those cameras keep rolling, capturing every single moment. Privacy? Ha! Huh, nice try. It's going off, no talking. You're not allowed to talk when the cameras are off because they don't want to miss anything. In fact, Dana Cohen of season 10 fame spilled the beans on the extreme measures they had to resort to just to claw back a moment of solitude. The cameras are always on you, she said, the entire time. Like I mentioned earlier, even in the bathroom. If you know you're gonna have a mental breakdown and start crying, what you can do though, you have to sing. If you sing a song while you're crying, they can't put that on TV. A copyrighted song. But singing that they can't get no privacy was the least of their concerns. Here's what else she had to say. One, they never had a wallet. Two, they never had their phone. Three, they're wearing a microphone 24-7, like I mentioned earlier. And four, get this, imagine you doze off and suddenly, someone's digging up your shirt to swap out their batteries. Remember how I said privacy is a complete fantasy in Hell's Kitchen? And hot water. What? This order here, 7.35, hello? For chefs gunning for a shot at one of Gordon Ramsay's top chef gigs, it's a seriously toxic scene. And it's not just the physical toll though, that's rough enough. It's also the drama. They found a way to kick me off the show to make it some sort of wild and shocking and crazy episode and get them good ratings. Oh, the drama. In short, the stress levels are off the charts on even the most leisurely day at the studio. That's for that. Imagine nights without sleep, getting chewed out for the tiniest slip up, and feeling like you're constantly under the microscope with all the cameras and mics adorning the place. Yeah, and the customers too. Weird, I have this nagging feeling there's more than a few videos on the topic from this small indie YouTuber called Film Traveler. Eh, might be overthinking things. Anyway, not surprising that the grind pushes many chefs to lean on cigarettes and booze to cope. I can't yell can't cry. All I have to do is I gotta do it. Here's a figure you've probably heard before. In season two, a producer noticed a worrying trend. At the start, only four contestants smoked. But by the season's end, that number shot up to 10. And I gotta say, every time I come across this little factoid, it breaks my heart. Lifelong addiction and greater risk for lung disease for what? A competition? Yeah, they're everywhere, and then there's booms flying all over the place. Yeah. Believe me, the restaurant Trump is itself is a real pressure cooker in terms of stress, so it's not really a surprise that there's a pretty similar microcosm going on in Hell's Kitchen. After all, it's a fast-paced, high-stress gig, with marathon shifts lasting 15 to 16 hours. The last thing these folks need is to put up with a million Karens, or an extremely pissed Ramsay, on top of all of that. I don't believe that every executive chef that's established in the world has gone through and like negativity 
no amount of money is worth that stress. And yes, the occasional fire too. Boy, are there ever. See, it's not just Hell's Kitchen chefs that have complained of an unhealthy environment. During the pandemic, Ramsey caught flack for, allegedly, mistreating his crew. For him, that he has no idea what's going on. How long, Adam? Four minutes. Now, you've probably seen him become the emotional rock that the staff on Kitchen Nightmares and Hotel Hell have been dreaming of. And heard all about his great rapport with more than a few contestants, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wondering, how does he really treat his own team behind closed doors? Well, in March of 2020, the Daily Mail reported that Ramsey's eateries were shutting down because of government regulations that cropped up during the pandemic. Around 500 staff members supposedly got the boot during a meeting at his Head & Street kitchen spot. Word is, they were offered a month's pay as a severance package. Anka Torpuk, a former chef at Bread Street Kitchen, was pretty disappointed with the way the place handled the situation. She remarked that it was regrettable to see the company discard people on a whim, especially given the dedication she and others had been putting in for over the course of two years of service. Torpuk also brought up that 500 people figure and directed her thanks to Gordon Ramsay and Gordon Ramsay restaurants, hoping they could reflect on the impact their decisions had on the people who were making their daily operations happen in the first place. In her conversation with Mail Online, she further commented that everyone had put in considerable effort for Gordon Ramsay, only to be let go when they needed his backing the most. And yeah, if any restaurateur was able to prop up their business with their own coffers in 2020, it was definitely Ramsey. Restaurant critic Marina O'Lowlin took to Twitter to denounce the decision too. Because after all, smaller establishments were doing their utmost for their employees at the same time. She demanded to know, where is our list? And I get it. I know my local hole in the wall taco place did everything they could to keep their workers happy and healthy. But Ramsey has never, nor will ever back down from a challenge. He hit back with, you've clearly never run a business, and yet across these very difficult times for all, you hide behind your pathetic tweets. Get a grip, will you? Now, let me tell you, everybody was pretty peeved about this. If Ramsey thought he was being clever with his response, he missed the mark. And yeah, this Twitter user was onto something when he accused him of being egotistical. Another person hit the nail on the head too, pointing out how the wealthy elite routinely ditch vulnerable workers during a crisis and chalk it up as just business. Because when businesses get that big, human lives end up being nothing more than a rounding error on a spreadsheet. I mean, they've got a point, don't they? It's not healthy to idolize celebs to the point where we turn a blind eye to the way they conduct themselves, right? <clears throat> Elon Musk. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, something in my throat there. Uh, well, I think you can see how a lot of people were fed up with Ramsey here. So, moving on for more clarity, let's take Tennille from Season 6. She talked about a major lesson she took away from her stint in Hell's Kitchen. Don't be a jerk. It's as simple as that. Preaching to the choir, Tennille. Anyway, she emphasized how important it is to consider how your actions impact others. Having felt the fear stirred up by Ramsey's presence firsthand, she saw, and better yet, lived the harmful effects of his aggressive leadership style. Tennille said, When Ramsey walked in, fear was the immediate reaction. I used to have a tough demeanor, but experiencing that treatment firsthand made me realize it wasn't cool. While I may work for Ramsey, it's not something I want in my kitchen anymore. Colleen had something similar to say as well. I never had the chance to see the real man. I only saw a tyrant who was spitting and frothing at the mouth. If you think being labeled a tyrant is the worst of what former contestants have to say about the guy, wait till you hear about what Season 6's Tony had to say. They only show a certain amount, but he's like Hitler, man. He's a Nazi in the kitchen. I have no respect for him at all. Between those two bleeps, I'm certain you get the gist of it. Plenty of food industry bigwigs have called out Ramsay for glorifying toxicity too. Chef Stevie Parle, owner of London hotspots like Palatino and Kraft London, chimed in with a tweet of his own. Glamorizing this kind of crap sets us back. No wonder we're struggling to find decent chefs. But all that restaurant drama aside... There's a whole lot more going on under the surface here. Ever hear how Gordon Ramsay once got accused of exploiting someone's death for entertainment? Crazy, right? But it's true. In a 2017 ITV documentary about cocaine, Ramsay got real about how the drug had rocked his world after one of his chef protégés, David Dempsey, fell victim to it in 2003. 
David, just 31 at the time, passed away after falling to his death, and I'll spare you the details, but the drug was very much involved. Ramsey had no clue David was into drugs, especially since he had two kids, but he eventually came to learn how he took that fatal fall from a 40-foot height after visiting a dealer's place to, well, resupply. I went back home and he went back to Chelsea, he said. He went to a dealer's house that gave him some stuff and it him over. Ramsey also mentioned that he had dinner with David on the night of his death. Apparently, David seemed really agitated and kept darting off to the bathroom. Learning this only deepened Ramsey's feelings of guilt and sorrow after the tragic loss too. He was there to witness his struggles and in his own home too. Regardless, the facts stand. The coroner's report pointed to a mix of alcohol and cocaine triggering an episode of excited delirium right before the fatal fall. Now, this is a bit tricky for me to really sink my teeth into. I don't think that this is just lip service. It's not like Ramsey didn't have any skin in the game. His younger brother Ronnie battled a serious addiction that really messed with his life. Ramsey opened up about how seeing his brother spiral into addiction changed his outlook on substances early on. Ramsey remembered having to tag along with his brother to score heroin before their father's funeral, and it was just as traumatic for him as you're probably expecting it to be. And well, he also put himself at risk over it when he decided to talk face to face with a dealer in a sting that he took part in himself. Uh, the chance of him getting caught? Is he armed? Is he, is he not? Who knows? And how do you think that turned out? Where does the main source come in from? Comes in from. Well, I love Ramsey, but he's definitely no Chris Hansen. Maybe leave the sting ops to the professionals. Either way, that isn't the only time he's done something so dangerous, but more on that in an upcoming video. For now, let's take a trip back to season 20. Every day when you're in that kitchen, how's kitchen security? So in that season, Chef Ramsay dropped a bombshell on finalists Megan Gill and Trenton Garvey. He accused them of stashing loads of cannabis and warned that they were done if they didn't own up to it. This is grounds for disqualification. Do you have any idea what's going to happen now? Well, turns out it was all just a prank. And like everyone who's uttered the phrase, it's just a prank, bro, Ramsey got torn up for the move over on Reddit. One fan vented, I guess the producers felt like there wasn't enough natural drama, so they had to manufacture some so they could make clickbait type teasers. And in 20 seasons, I've never ever felt this angry. Hey, I resent that. But uh, seriously, here's another, easily the unfunniest thing that I have ever seen and easily Ramsey's biggest unnecessary dick moment. While the prank may have created some internet buzz, it also may have alienated longtime viewers, like this commenter who chipped in with, that wasn't even remotely funny at all. But as a card-carrying OG fan, people have been blowing up at the controversies since day one. You four hells bitches. This viewer took the words from my mouth by bringing up this creepy incident from season two. So picture this, it's two hours into service and nearly every customer has their main course, except for one lady. She marches up to the kitchen and confronts Ramsey. Now, there were plenty of ways he could have handled it, but instead, he came out with this gem. Off my hot plate. Yeah, look at that. How can I serve food with those fucking things there? Well, this lady was made of sterner stuff than I think anybody expected. And to any boomers watching, this isn't about being overly sensitive. Let's take it without context here. Ramsey was too busy to serve a customer because he was too busy ogling at her chest. Seriously, does he even hear himself? Now, that's a perfect segue into all the times he's made appearance-related jabs. I'm talking about insults targeting contestants' height and weight. Like, how is that supposed to help them up their cooking game, huh? Viewers have been buzzing about this chef from season three, thinking he was set up by the producers just for laughs. Born with the kidneys, disease, you know, stunts your growth. So here's what one viewer had to say, and honestly, I think we're all on the same page here. Eddie's elimination just didn't add up. Nobody can deny that Ramsey's treatment of him during the elimination was pretty controversial to say the least. 
As you might expect, the criticism came out in droves in the aftermath. But what really stirred the pot was Rock's reason for nominating him in the first place. Remember that? I, and I'm not sure when he can come out of that shell and be an asset to our team. I mean, the guy didn't choose to be born that way. Insults might be par for the course on the show, but let's not forget, it's a cooking competition first and foremost. Attacking someone's appearance instead of their actual skill? Not cool. Now it looks like plenty of folks agree. Little stupid bitch. Yes, chef. Check out this viewer, who was honestly sick and tired of all the non-cooking related jabs and insults on the show. And on the same note, I genuinely felt for Rob, who had to endure a barrage of body shaming jokes from Ramsay during the reward in season 8 episode 6. And if that wasn't bad enough, check out this one. Make Rob look like 95 pounds. <laughs> Honestly, even with the most generous interpretation I can think of, all of this is nothing short of discrimination, plain and simple. Body shaming jokes should never be passed off as humor. It wasn't funny back then, and it isn't now. In reality, they're what keeps the stigma they're derived from alive and kicking, just making it an even bigger vicious cycle. But fortunately for all of us, Ramsey has become more sensitive and open-minded over the years. In 2021, he took to Instagram Live to express his pride in his daughter Matilda Ramsey, who you might know better as Tilly. Ramsey showed his support for Tilly by praising her for standing up to presenter Steve Allen after he called her a chubby little thing, following her success on Strictly Come Dancing. We're not going to tolerate that. And listen, you know, it's, it's a very sensitive issue that, uh, whether you're a girl or a guy. Well, I guess there's the argument that since she's his own flesh and blood, it's different. But hey, a win's a win at the end of the day. But the same cannot be said for sous chef Scott. He got away with way too much stuff. Yeah, you better bet I'm talking about part of one of the final services that Andrea was in charge of running. Seconds longer in a hot pan. Come on, make that story happen fast. Yeah, the rest fuck of the you. Ramsey made it crystal clear. This was her time to shine, no one else's. And shine she did. Andrea wasted no time setting a blistering pace in the kitchen. Dishes flew out faster than ever, all thanks to her lightning fast coordination. But while she was making it look easy, that doesn't mean it actually was easy. Her first big challenge in quality control came when sous chef Scott slipped up, sending out halibut instead of dory. Andrea's sharpness got put to the test, but unfortunately, she didn't catch the mistake before Ramsey did. It was a slip that stung, a blunt she couldn't afford at that stage in the game. But determined to bounce back, Andrea kicked things into high gear from then on. She became super meticulous, scrutinizing every plate with laser focus. This newfound attention to detail, while aimed at nailing perfection, started to rub some folks the wrong way. Namely, sous chef Scott. He found himself in Andrea's crosshairs a little more than the rest. And it wasn't bullying, no, the guy was genuinely slipping up. But don't tell sous chef Scott that or he'll fly off the handle like he did here. I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna fucking punch you in the face. I knew he was pissed. Was Andrea getting a bit nitpicky? I don't personally think so, but I can see an argument being made in its favor. Keep me honest in the comments down below. 45 seconds longer in a hot pan. Come on, make that story happen fast. But either way, even if she was being too particular, that's exactly what Ramsey told her to do. Sue Chef Scott really crossed the line here. And like Ramsey before him, everyone online wanted a piece of the pie. Take this viewer, for example. They found that some of his digs were totally uncalled for and had nothing to do with where the contestants had gone wrong. Threats of physical harm and gender-based insults? Yeah, that doesn't help anyone get better at their job. And it definitely shouldn't be brushed off as normal. Speaking of things that shouldn't be normal, this viewer is convinced that the show's producers orchestrate creepy behavior from the men every Every time a woman appears on screen, every single time there's a new woman on screen, it cuts to the men saying creepy and well, we got the tapes right here to do our own research with. First, there's Paul doing this. Oh, I got a picture of 
<laughs> Enjoy your yacht victory, sure, but that was just plain invasive. Had nobody on their team even heard about consent? And what's with this? It's definitely interesting to see Natalie a little tipsy. The show unnecessarily zooms in on women's body parts. At best, it feels voyeuristic, and at worst, it's just plain gross that that's what the editors thought was the most interesting about the raw footage. Literally the male gaze at work. Seriously. Real life people aren't fan service bait. And many viewers have pointed out that the editing on the show, particularly in the earlier seasons, had that male gaze front and center. Everybody who saw my fun muffins, y'all all owe me $20. Like, look at this clip right here and tell me I'm wrong. You better watch out, Cody's on the loose. Today was a stressful day. We made it through, we're still here, so. Now, as much as I love Ramsey and his food and TV empires, I'm a firm believer in keeping people honest. I expect you to do the same for me, and I'm gonna do the same for Ramsey. So definitely get in the comments with any controversies I missed, or if you're trying to keep me honest instead. And hey, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. It really does help me keep the good stuff coming your way each and every day. But while you do that, don't forget to check out this next one right here. It's even better. <sighs>